Let's kick it. Hello and welcome to what's new in 2250. Now first things first, may see I've got the display properties open. And that's because we all know that this build has the professional theme on, well, as it by default, or you can just switch it on. So I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of that. But one thing I am going to show you is, well, describe really why it's there, is all these desktop text, which has which is black, and when I mouse over them, the tooltips, which are also black with grey text. Now those bits are commented out in the theme, so I uncommented them like I did for the 2223 video, and so I just wanted to explain the differences that you're seeing here. So, and you'll see it with some of the balloons on the notification icons later on. Another well known thing in this build is the desktop start page. Uh, I'll just show you that. Yeah, so, as you see, and if you've seen on the internet, there's this well there's another well known picture going about of it all in working order and I'll show you that now. Now I can categorically state that that picture did not come from this build in any way shape or form. Now why do I know that? Because the components which the start page used to fill in the user picture and the username and all that, it uses a component that doesn't exist in this build. So if I look at the source code See here, it uses a component called DT Help, and that doesn't exist in the registry of this build. Uh, oh, I don't want that one up, do I? I this one up. And if I go to RegEdit and look at all the prog IDs, because that's what them dotted names are called, prog IDs, we can see if we go down to the DT. You see, there's no DT help there whatsoever. Just go straight from Drift File to DS Start Panel and down to Done File at the bottom. So there's no such component as that here, and that, as you can see here, is responsible for the username and the user picture. So that's the reason why that doesn't work. And also, if we look at the source of the actual these bits here, which are meant to be filled in with the programs and the files and folders and all that. If we look at the code of those, see here they use, that's the bottom line, I don't want that one, recent files and folders, they use a object with the class ID F and the rest of it. And when my mouse stops acting up, I can eventually go back to the registry, and then we want CLS ID, and we can see what F3 something or other. See, there's no FE fours whatsoever. So she, that is also not in the registry. So that picture did not whatsoever come from this build as it was distributed to well to whoever had it and leaked it. You can restore the user picture and the username and this picture at the top by modifying it and using the Shijin interfaces that we I showed you in 2211 was it? I think it was. And that's shell.users. And if we go down here, we want to change it to the current user dot setting. And that wants to be logon name. So I can delete that since I've backed this file up. And down here we want to do pretty much the same thing. Easiest way to do it. Picture I think that's what it is. Let's just consult the oracle here. That's just picture. Yeah. Logon name is right though, isn't it? Login name. Will that F makes the world of difference? Right, so if we save that. Go away. 
I think we have to close it and then start it again. And there we go. We got the picture and we've got all that back. The username and the the user picture. But these you can't restore these because they don't exist in this build and obviously I'm not writing loads of code just to restore them because there's no point. So yeah, you can restore some functionality of the start page, but not much of it. Not the useful part of it anyway. 2250 is also the first build which introduced DirectX 8 to the base operating system. Now I'm no graphics programmer so I can't show you any WYSI graphics spinning around the screen, but what I can show you is one oddity in the registry that came along with it. Now it's this top entry on HK classes root, it's got a blank name, but over here it says CLSID direct input config UI test. It's a bit of a mouthful. And so it's got a class ID, but it doesn't have a version or a prog ID. So yeah. I went into the DLL and looked at it and found that it's based off a sample that's in the DirectX 8 SDK. But this actual interface is not in that sample. So the DLL is built from the sample pretty much, but this interface isn't in there. So what I did was make some code to call the interface to see what we get. And when I remember the name of the program, DUI tester. Then after a little bit of waiting, you get this screen, which is, I guess, a direct UI direct input UI tester. Now if you press the keys on the keyboard it goes to where that is in the list. And you also got this layout button which can switch it, it's not what I wanted. Yep, and that goes down the list and up the list as well. But the actual thing about this, the the probably the best thing about this, because I don't think it actually changes anything this. It's just a test. Is if you right click in this well in this dotted area and then go to new view. You get this customized this view and you can just start playing around with the UI. Now I don't know why this is in here because this obviously has nothing to do with input. And you can move that and then move whatever that is. Then when you've done that you can draw a line. And it's, well, you draw a polygon with it. <laughs> And then you can pick a key which it supposedly represents. So I guess this is how they originally built this control by doing this and then somehow saved it off afterwards. But I don't know, it just seems like a weird thing to have in a UI test, in an input testing thing. So yeah, you can pick a, a bitmap which does something. I don't think I've got any bitmaps available, so I'll just cancel that. And yeah, you get a. You can click on it and obviously you can t type in, oh, it goes back to that view. So that didn't. So yeah, I just thought that was an interesting thing that they've got on there, you can delete them all. That just kills all them. You can remove the view. You can also sort of save it and export it, but that doesn't work. So yeah, I just thought that was an interesting little thing in this what's supposedly an input tester. And it's just not an input tester and you can draw your own sort of UI in it as well. Another change in this build is from the last build is the NetPL wizard. Remember I showed you it last time and it went through, it had that buggy UI and then you could click on it and then it didn't do anything in the end. Well now it's in the UI as publish this file to the web. And we get this actual first page of the wizard this time, the tutorial button still doesn't do anything. If we go next, now we can either pick MSN like we could before or we can pick up, we don't have to choose any like folder names or anything like that, we can just pick a website to send our files to and this actually does something this time so if I go OK and it goes, oops there's a problem connecting it to the website but if we look in Wireshark at what actually went on behind the scenes there go down to here we can see that it Actually, it went sent a request to Google, uh, asked for the HTTP options, and then Google went, "Nope, you can't do that there. Can't, we don't support that." And then it promptly gave up, and I'm sure it did something else as well. And it asked again, 
let it run. Then it got the same response back. And then it does something else, this wizard, after that. It then asks for these VTI inf files on the actual web server. Now Google doesn't have them, obviously, because these are actually front page files for Microsoft front page server extensions. As you can see there, MS front page 4. So what it does is it looks for those files, and then if it doesn't see the VTI inf file, then asks for the VTI bin shtml exe file and tries to do some remote procedure calls to it. And then Google doesn't support that, so it goes, nope, can't do that either. So then it asks for the inf file again. And it goes, nope, still not there. And then it asks for the server, the shtml exe again. And then Google goes, no, it's still not here, what are you doing? And then it finally gives up and goes, well, I can't send out to that host, it doesn't support it. So what it's meant to do is send files via the front page extensions on the server and it will copy them files to there. And if it well if, if it finds them then they put them on the web server. And if it didn't, then obviously it doesn't work. Now if you go to the MSN one, this kind of half works. You go next, it says you've had to view pages of a secure connection. You go OK, then you wait a bit. I'll chop this out in the final bit. And then eventually, at the end, you get action cancelled. And the, gen and the normal error page, the top bit's still buggy because there's no there. Now if we go back to Wireshark, we can see that it actually had a lot of conversation with the MSN server. And this time it asked for WinWiz. I don't know what that is, but then the MSN server says, nope, we haven't got that now, it's gone somewhere else. And it tells it that it's now at here. And I think this is a bug with their redirection, because it says https communities.msn.com, then attached straight after it is after it is onedrive.live.com, the, 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 the group view. So I think they've, they've bugged there by obviously not separating that from that. Obviously nobody's going to still be using this. The publishing wizard from a beta build of Windows to actually make their website. But yeah, I just thought that that redirect there was was a bit buggy. And I tried looking at the Wayback Machine to see if the actual WinWiz was still there, but it's not, so I can't show you that or what it's meant to be. Also new in this build in the folder tasks is email this folder. Now this is probably one of the most useless options ever in the history of Windows. If you click on it, what you send is not like a, a zip of all the files in the folder because zipping doesn't come in until build 2410. Note what you get, what you send if you send the email is a, a shortcut file of all 279 bytes of it. In this case, you send a shortcut file to whoever that's pretty useless because the shortcut files are relative to that computer. So I don't know what the point of that is because you'd send it off to somebody and all somebody would get is a link that's, that opens C colon slash bits and obviously if they don't have C bits then it, it wouldn't work. So that's a pretty useless option that I don't know why it's there. I mean maybe later on it they get compression and archive things up into a single file and send that but as for now it's pretty useless. Another change from the last build is some of the network credential dialogues got some new branding. Now what do I mean by that? This here, this network connection thing, when you're trying to connect to network shares and you need a password and username, you get this dialogue. It's this old dialogue but with some new branding on top and it says that temporary bitmap. And its counterpart, which was brought in from Netune in the last build, but I didn't mention it then, the Windows Keyring, which is keymanager.exe. And what these do is work together to remember your network credentials so you don't have to keep typing them in every time. So if you notice now it's empty, the keyring is empty, and if I connect to my proper laptop from the virtual machine, see that it connects and we get that. Now that's still empty, but if I restart it, then you get a new entry here. And 
what that is that's the saved credentials to connect to laptop for this user and you can go to edit and obviously you can I didn't choose to save the password so it hasn't saved the password but if it if you did do it, it would save it there and you can use these credentials for well the logon session only which means until you log off and um, this account on this machine so Bob on this machine forever and this account on any machine which I think is for Active Directory and roaming user profiles and that so it just take it with you to every machine you logged onto. I don't know what this means here, save as non-secure generic credentials, don't know what that means. I think it just means it might just save it as plain text instead of hashing it or whatever it does to save it nice and securely. But yeah, that's the keyring and the new branding on the network share logon dialog. Now to tie up some loose ends from a previous video. In 2202, you may remember I showed you this function, RTL interlock to push enter S-list, which was new then. And I said it used a processor feature called ComputeExchange 8B in order to make lockless program, in order to do some lockless multi-threaded programming and make it faster. And then if it didn't, that uh, processor feature didn't exist, it used a, a lock that it used in other parts of Windows. And I said that that was not very good software development and they'd fix it up in a future, at some future point. Well, 2250 is that future point, and if we look now, we can see it's been streamlined quite a lot. And now all it does is straight use that feature, because now there's no fallback. You have to have a CPU which supports ComputeExchange 8B, or you will not be able to run this version of Windows. Now you can simulate this in VirtualBox, which is what I'm using. So what you do is, to turn that feature off and see what happens without it, is first well the easiest thing to do is to open up a log from a VM that you've already got running for that version of the operating system so this is the Whistler VM that I've got running and you scroll down to where it says raw standard CPU IDs and you come to this one here the guest one you don't want the bottom the host one because that's what your real computer is the guest is what VirtualBox reports to that one and you want the first function now you need all these numbers here and what you need to do is turn off the one bit which represents ComputeExchange 8B. Now which one's that? Well if we use a reference and use Microsoft reference here we can see it's bit 8 as you can see there, bit 8 in EDX and the info type argument is 1 so in the log that corresponds to 1 and as you see here this column is EDX so that's this one here so what we need to do is copy that and turn off bit 8 now if you're not up on your hex or bits you can use Windows Calculator because that simulate that's got a hex built into it. If you go to programming mode and then you switch it to hex and you type in the EDX value, so that's seven eight B F B F F. Then what you need to do is turn off bit eight. Now computers like counting from zero, so it's this one here, and that sends it to AFF. Then what you need to do is in a new VM, not in that one, because it won't let you set the one that's already running. So I've got one here called test, so what you need to do is open up a command line because there's no GUI feature to set this and you need to type in vbox manage, modify vm, the name of the vm, then you need to use the cpu id set command, then you want one which corresponds to the guest here, this one, one obviously, and then you need to type in all those numbers there, except for the last one which we've modified, so we've got 306a9, 800, 209 then here I put the AFF in then you go enter and if all goes nice you don't get any error messages or anything so then you close it open up the VM which we've modified now this is just about to start set up this VM and what happens is you then get this screen which I think only about three people in the history have ever have ever seen and obviously it says Windows Whistler requires certain processor features that are not available on your CPU Specifically, Windows Whistler requires the following CPU, the following instructions. Now, CPU ID, which is what we've just seen, what we've obviously got that, and ComputeExchange 8B. And if you don't have that, setup cannot continue, and you press any key to exit, and then you'll end up in a in a booting cycle because obviously you don't have that feature installed. So yeah, this the the elegant way they managed to get rid of not requiring that lock is to just make the whole OS require that CPU feature. And if you didn't have it, well, you can't install this or any future build of Windows beta or not. Also, as a callback to a previous video and some loose ends, 
the spaces that were introduced to narrator and a quiz they've also been fixed in this build as you can see there the sensory software url that got chopped off is now perfectly fine so i just thought i'd mention that to clear that up another fun thing i found in the resources of 2250 is in the certificate manager dll if we go into the resources and find 11 icon and we show it we get a nice smiley face icon I don't know why that's there, but I don't know where it is used. If we look at Dialog 107, it's used in this auto auto enrollment for certificates dialog. I don't know what this does, and I can't get it to show in the UI primarily because I think it's Active Directory related, and I haven't got a domain controller or anything like that set up on my network or in the virtual box, so and I can't bother setting it up just for this. So yeah, it's just a nice smiley face icon in the dialog. Another new thing in this build um, is the default web view, which is a see we saw it a little bit in the last build, but this build has some interesting new well not interesting, but it has some new features in it. Now if you navigate to a folder and then you click on well click on the folder to navigate to it and then hold shift immediately after clicking, you then get these borders around everything, which are well, they're just to see where the layout is. They're specifically called out in the source code for this as like, just debugging placeholder things. And that's not the end of it. If you do that again, but this time hold control instead of shift, when I get it right, you then get this box at the top here, which you can't really see it, but it says click here to see header section row dot inner HTML. And what this does is, you click it, and it displays the HTML for this main bit of the web view here. As you can see, object class equals no display, header style is display none, and all that good stuff, which is of use to the Windows developers, not, but not much use to really anybody else. Obviously, if you click this twice, then Explorer doesn't like that, and goes, whoa, I'm not having that, and it crashes. But yeah, some their web view we saw in the last build has been upgraded with the debugging stuff in this build, and you can use it for pretty much anyone. The shift one doesn't work when you're going to the look to the disk one though, because this is using the old style web view since so it have the blue bar across the top. Just using the old style drive folder view, so you can't see in this, but any others you can see it obviously, and it still crashes. So it doesn't matter which folder you go into, it just crashes. That's going to about do it for part one of this. I've split it up into two videos because no, I don't think even the most ardent Windows fan wants to see a straight hour of this. So I split it up into two videos. So I hope to see you again in part two.